Okay, uh, let's go ahead and get started. So welcome to the first uh, scientific talk for the hands-on school. Um, before I introduce the speaker, I'm going to make one announcement. I'm going to ask the question. So we had the whole uh, ordeal with the bank this morning. How many people did not make it through the bank? Raise your hand. Okay. Okay, would you come see me after the talk, but before we go to the hands-on session? We'll make, we have a, make a plan for a plan B so you can get your money tomorrow. Okay, so come see me. Um, okay, um, so I'll just let you know the, the procedure for today is we'll have a, a talk and then immediately afterwards um, we'll get together. We'll have, uh, before, uh, before you leave from here, uh, Professor Shattuck will pass out a schedule which will give you the schedule of uh, of the hands-on sessions that you'll attend, so you'll learn which is your first session today along with the rest of the sessions. Okay, so that will happen immediately afterward. And then after that, we will progress up to uh, the various locations. Um, most locations will be up at the M lab, the multidisciplinary lab. So I'm going to ask the uh, hands-on session leaders to um, to stick around and uh, and uh, basically help guide the group as a whole up to, to that session. The only difference or the only session that will remain here is Professor Chembo's uh, session. So if you and that will be in the UN room. So you'll learn what that is shortly. If you're in uh, Dr. Chembo's session, when you get the handout, you stay here, stay with him. Everyone else will progress up to the multidisciplinary lab, the M lab. Okay? Any questions or any other issues? Oh yes, I'm sorry about that. That's right. There's also those sessions. So let, let stay in your seats. We'll pass out the schedule and then we'll tell you which groups go where. Some it's more than one session stays here. Um, and those that will go to the M lab will congregate as a group and head up to that lab together. Okay, so uh, it's uh, my great pleasure to introduce Professor Harry Swinney from the University of Texas. He's one of the founding directors of the Hands-On Schools, and he's going to tell us about the philosophy behind tabletop experiments. So I turn the floor over to him. Okay, thank you, Mike. So I will be talking about a particular type of hands-on experiments, experiments in which we observe the emergence of patterns as some parameter is varied. Uh, you read a, a lot about science and hear a lot about science in the news these days, and that's great. Science is getting a lot of publicity. And often the science that you hear about, most often, is big science. Science where you have projects that cost $10 billion or even $20 billion involve uh, thousands of sciences in a single project, and they take periods of decades. The um, Large Hadron Collider uh, was uh, conceived in the 1990s and constructed in the early part of the, of, uh, the 2000s, came into operation in 2007, and in 2012, made this major discovery, something that had been anticipated for a half century, the discovery of the Higgs boson that uh, was expected based on the standard model of particle physics. And this experiment is continuing. And we, our university in Texas, have a number of members of this collaboration. But as I said, there are thousands. There, two of my colleagues work on the Atlas detector, which was one of the detectors that saw the uh, Higgs boson, detected the Higgs boson. Another large project, which is much in the news recently, is one that was conceived in the 1960s to look for, for radiation, gravitational radi radiation, that uh, goes back in concept to Einstein's equations, which have form of wave equations. These are waves that are exhibited uh, by uh, masses, in, large masses interacting. In this case, 
the waves that were detected were produced by two black holes that collided and gave ripples in space and time. So this was a, a major discovery, very exciting. Uh, after at least a half century of anticipation and experiments. The first systematic experiment was 1967 or so. But it failed until this recent experiment to detect gravity waves. Another large project, which is uh, costing, will cost of order of $20 billion, is the project that's under construction in France, ITER, to produce a plasma that will be very hot, and you'll have uh, deuterons and, and uh, tritium atoms colliding and fusing together and releasing energy. And there will be more energy released than, than uh, taken to heat up this plasma to very high temperatures. Very high temperatures are required because you have the coulombic repulsion of these protons that must be overcome to get them to fuse. They must come down within a distance of 10 to the minus 15 meters. So they must be very hot. So these are the kinds of science projects that are most often in the news, but they're not what we're here to study this week and not what I'm here to talk about this week. There is science that can be done on a smaller scale, a smaller scale than 10 to the ninth dollars, let's say a million times smaller, maybe a thousand dollars, maybe less. Over time of a year or so, a couple of years, uh, scientists and maybe two students can use inexpensive equipment, such as webcams that we'll be using this week, uh, interface between the computer and the experiment to control the experiments, an Arduino, or or fidget controller, and we have enormous computational power available that was not available even 25 years ago. The, the um, laptops you can buy for $500 are as powerful as the largest supercomputer of 1990. And the storage that's available is enormous. And one day in the experiments that we do on ocean physics, dynamics of oceans now in my lab, uh, we generate a couple terabytes of data, inconceivable uh, even a few de decades ago. And we can do computations. We can solve the equations of motion, the partial differential equations using MATLAB. We can build models and, and do a lot of science at a fairly sl small investment. A lot of thinking power, but not a lot of dollars, right? So let's look at some examples. Uh, the problems I'm particularly interested in discussing today are those in which we take a system in thermodynamic equilibrium and drive it away from the equilibrium state. We impose a gradient and increase the size of the gradient. We move further away from the thermodynamic equilibrium state. Gradient could be gradient in temperature, or velocity, or concentration, or some other variable. This type of problem was studied a century ago, first uh, systematic studies. Consider a fluid in a box at a uniform temperature, say a gas or a liquid in a box. If you look at the motion of a molecule and its neighbors, the motion of one molecule affects neighbors that are only a few molecular diameters away, a few nanometers away. Now, if we heat the bottom and hold the top plate fixed at a lower temperature, you can imagine what would happen, and you all know from, everyone knows, from putting a pan of water on a stove, you heat it from below, and after you've applied heat for few minutes, you see the bubbling of the fluid. You see the motion of the fluid. It, the uh, fluid is no longer in the stationary state. You have convection. So it was a problem of interest a century ago. And the question was, is there a well-defined temperature difference between the top and bottom? 
at which this motion begins, at which you move away from the stationary state and have a new kind of state. So this problem was studied in the laboratory by a Frenchman named Henri Benard, and those experiments inspired Lord Rayleigh to investigate the problem theoretically, and he found that there was indeed in his simple model a critical temperature difference beyond which you have the onset of convection. So fluid rises, the warm fluid rises here and goes down here. So you have a convection roll. And these rolls become more intense as you increase the temperature difference delta T. Now, he did an analysis and predicted the temperature at which temperature difference at which this would occur. And it didn't, the result from the theory did not agree with the experiments of Henri Bonnard. They were off quite a bit, and no one, no one understood why. So the leading scientists, a number of leading scientists of the time, said, well, maybe we should select a simpler problem. What could be simpler than two infinite parallel plates, one moving with respect to the other? So if they're stationary, there's no motion of the fluid. If you move the upper plate, then the fluid near the upper plate is moving at the same speed, oops, same speed as the, as the uh, fluid there, right there. And there's linear variation of velocity with position between the plates, as you can calculate quickly from the uh, fluid equations, Napier-Stokes equation. But how large does the speed have to be for the fluid to be, have a flow that's different from this linear variation with position. Can that be predicted? So a number of leading scientists at the time tried to calculate this critical velocity at which the, the fluid would develop a pattern, and they failed. But another geometry was considered by uh, scientists at Cambridge University, G.I. Taylor. He was an experimentalist, and he was interested in doing experiments to compare with theory. But he said, you know, it's very difficult in the laboratory to have two infinite plates. They tend to be finite in size. So he took the two plates and made a drum, made a circle. So he has two concentric cylinders. And the fluid is contained between the two cylinders. And each of the cylinders could rotate in this experiment. But let's say, suppose just the inner cylinder rotates. Can you predict, as you begin from zero rotation rate and increase it, can you predict the critical rotation frequency at which a pattern would form? And this is often expressed in terms of the dimensionalist number, the Reynolds number. But omega is the rotation rate of the inner cylinder. And he calculated that at a critical rotation rate, vortices, fluid vortices, would form between the two cylinders. And they would be in the shape of a donut. And these donuts are stacked in the axial direction. And let's see. Yeah. He obtained this theoretical curve. And he also did experiments. So he did theory and experiments. And on this graph, you have the speed of the inner cylinder here increasing vertically, and the speed of the outer cylinder in the horizontal direction here, horizontal axis. So this point is thermodynamic equilibrium. Both cylinders are at rest. And as, he, as you increase the speed, say, of the inner cylinder with the outer cylinder at rest, you're going up this axis. At a certain point, he's predicted that the pattern would form. Actually, he knew it would form because he did the experiment first. Right? And then he set about to predict the point of instability. So you see the experimental points here in red, and the uh, theoretical points here in these green dots. And agreement's remarkably good within a percent or two for the, between the experiment and theory. And this is a quote from his paper. He said, previous attempts by some pretty good theoretical physicists, Kelvin, Lord Rayleigh, Hopf, we all know, Sommerfeld, 
to calculate the point at which a fluid would become unstable and a pattern would form, have failed. Calculate the speed at which, but here's a, an example where this was done. Now, this is the pattern. Uh, this is actually a picture taken in, in our laboratory, but it's similar to the picture that uh, G.I. Taylor obtained in his experiments by injecting dye into the fluid. And the dye collects at the boundaries between the vortices. So in one of these black lines, you have fluid flowing out. The next one, you have the fluid flowing in. But the dominant flow is in the azimuthal direction. Superposed in that, you have this toroidal flow. Now, as you saw yesterday, as I mentioned, you can increase the speed of the inner cylinder further, and you get further well-defined transitions that occur at a particular rotation frequency of the cylinder. You have this time-independent flow. The velocity field, the fluid particles are moving, but the velocity field is not changing in time at any one point in the flow. But in this case, you have these vortices develop waves above a certain critical speed of rotation of the inner cylinder. And as you go higher, ultimately you get to a flow which is not periodic. It is something more complex called chaotic flow. And if you go to very high rotation rates, you have turbulent flow. In a turbulent flow, you have a wide range of spatial scales and temporal scales which are involved in the description of the motion. Now, this is with the inner cylinder only rotating. What if you rotate the outer cylinder as well as the inner cylinder to make a graph like this? But look above this line here and see what happens up here. Well, that was done in, in an experiment, which I'll mention in a moment. But this is how we, in the lab session here that we have up on the hill will characterize these different flows. We'll take movies, digital movies, with a webcam and look at the intensity at a point in space as a function of time, a point in the image as a function of time. So we have a time series image of intensity. We Fourier transform it, get a power spectrum, and that's what's plotted here, power spectra as you increase the rotation rate of the cylinder. So when you have one kind of wave that's rotating around the, the cylinder, you get a single frequency component, maybe some harmonics. But only one frequency is necessary to characterize the dynamics. But as you go higher in rotation rate of the cylinder, you reach another transition, bifurcation. You, you have a transition in the solution in which you have two fundamental frequencies. Now, you see a lot of peaks in the power spectrum, um, but all of them are combinations of these two, like sums and differences of these two frequencies and multiples of those frequencies. So there are only two fundamental frequencies. So we have a doubly periodic flow. And then if we go yet higher with the speed of the inner cylinder, we see the background becomes noisy. The fluid is no longer simply periodic or multiply periodic. It is non-periodic. And uh, this kind of non-periodic behavior is called chaotic behavior. We'll talk about that further. Now, if you go and rotate both cylinders and start here at thermodynamic equilibrium, rotating the inner cylinder, you see what I've just described. You have this Taylor vortex flow the time-independent vortices in this region. And then the lighter blue here is where you have the waves that rotate around. If you go in the co-rotating frame with these waves, the flow is time-independent in that rotating frame. But if you go higher, you can get two frequencies. That's called waves that are modulated at another frequency, gives you two frequencies. And then you have the chaotic flow. But if you rotate the outer cylinder, First, at some frequency, and then go up. You get different kinds of transitions. This was a real surprise. A very complex diagram, which is still the subject of extensive research, both theoretical 
and experimental research. And it was just printed uh, in an annual review uh, paper a few months ago. And as an example of the complex behavior you have as you drive a system away from thermodynamic equilibrium. Now, turn to another problem. Alan Turing, familiar to everyone here from the Turing machine, the fundamental uh, model for a computer, uh, was thinking in the early 1950s about how do patterns form in biological systems? And why does a leopard have spots? Where do these patterns come from? Well, Alan Turing was not an experimentalist. He was not a scientist, uh, not a physical scientist or a chemical scientist. He was a mathematician, and he developed a model to address this question. And this, is, uh, this was Alan Turing's last paper. He, was, he became uh, interested in biology in a broad way, in particular pattern formation in biology. And he developed a mathematical model of a chemical system where you have chemicals, just two chemicals, that can react with one another, so you have a reaction rate, and they diffuse. There's no fluid motion, no fluid dynamics here, just reaction and diffusion, only two processes. And what can happen as you vary the concentration of the chemicals? Beyond a certain concentration of the chemi chemicals, he found a pattern would spontaneously arise. There would be a bifurcation, we call it a pitchfork bifurcation, a transition in the solutions of the equations that would describe this system. So he said, this is quoting from his paper, a system of chemical substances reacting together, that's the rate constant, and diffusing, imagining them diffusing through tissue, although it may be originally quite homogeneous, may later develop a pattern due to an instability of the homogeneous equilibrium. So people began to look for the Turing bifurcation to a pattern, and here, uh, now nearly 40 years later, it was observed. It, it's pretty simple to observe once you know how to do it, but it took uh, not only ourselves, but others a long time to figure out how to do a controlled experiment to observe a Turing pattern. Now, this pattern really is arising from a Turing transition, a Turing bifurcation. It's a transition at which the, the spots appear with zero amplitude, and the amplitude grows as the square root of the distance away from the transition. That's a pitchfork bifurcation behavior. And the analysis gives you a characteristic, Turing's analysis gives you a characteristic relationship of wavelength which is related to the diffusion coefficient of the chemical species. And the rate constant, rate constant for the reaction, gives you a time. This is a characteristic time. So this time was measured in the experiments independently. And the rate, uh, the diffusion of the chemicals in the experiment was measured separate from the pattern formation experiment. And the wavelength here is measured 0.2 millimeters. And this uh, pattern that you see here satisfies the Turing relation. So this is a, a Turing pattern. And th this was done in a reactor where you could bring in chemicals that were oxidizing chemicals and chemicals that were reducing chemicals and two separate reservoirs. These are stirred homogeneous reservoirs, and there's no reaction in this reservoir and no reaction in this reservoir. The chemicals diffuse into a gel that separates the two reservoirs, and that's where the pattern forms. So you take a picture looking through one of these reservoirs at the pattern that forms in the gel. Now, the analyses that Turing and Taylor took were both of the same type. You know the solution for the system near equilibrium, 
you can often, in many cases, solve and find the state of the system as it's uh, driven away from equilibrium, but still near equilibrium. It's homogeneous. It has the symmetry of the boundary conditions. And you can look then at what happens when you have an infinitesimal perturbation of that solution. So you have a uniform state, and you imagine an infinitesimal perturbation, which you always have in an experiment. Does that perturbation grow or decay? So this is the growth rate of the disturbance. This is the eigenvalue of an equation that you get uh, when you do the stability analysis that Turing and Taylor did. You get the growth rate, and the growth rate is negative for situations close to the equilibrium state. That is, R has some critical value, and if you're below that critical value, the dis this is distance away from thermodynamic equilibrium, then that growth rate is negative for all uh, disturbances. But as you increase your distance away from equilibrium, you increase R, you reach a critical value of the growth rate at which it becomes zero. And there's a characteristic link scale that comes from the analysis at which that happens. And you go just epsilon infinitesimally beyond that point, and you get the growth rate is positive. You get the growth of a pattern, spatial pattern. You no longer have a uniform state. And that's a general type of analysis. Turing knew, apparently, as far as anyone knows, he knew nothing about the work of Taylor. But the procedure he followed was the same in, in principle as Taylor had followed, and many others have followed. Now, OK. Well, this growth rate here, sigma, the growth rate of the disturbance, could be a real number, or it could be a complex number. If it's a complex number, you get traveling waves. And here, for chemical system, you get these waves. This is an oxidation front. Here's another one. They are traveling towards one another. When they collide, they annihilate. But that's beyond an instability where you have a complex eigenvalue for the growth rate. So you have traveling waves. And this particular reaction has been much studied. It's called the belisov jabotinsky reaction. OK. OK. Well, you have these spiral waves in physical situations and biological situations. You have spirals in the ocean and in galaxies, all kinds of situations with spiral wave solutions. But in the, in the heart, you have a pacemaker, the sinus node here, which sends out a signal to the heart to beat, electrical signal, and it propagates out in the normal heartbeat you have, 60 beats per minute or something. But sometimes when you have disease, the pathway, electrical pathway, can be broken. And then instead of having the regular beating, you get spirals forming. And these spirals rotate faster than the pacemaker is pacing. So they take over and make the heart beat very fast. You have irregular heartbeats, and they're very fast. Tachycardia, and then irregular fibrillation, and then you die. <laughs> and this happens in the United States to about 100,000 people per year, more than 100,000. In the world, I don't know, many people have this problem with these spiral waves forming in the heart. And so they're, they're in medical schools, many researchers studying how to interrupt these spiral waves and recover the normal uh, sinus rhythms that uh, you have for in a healthy heart, particularly at uh, Harvard Medical School and Duke Medical School. If you can uh, give the right external stimulus, you can maybe interrupt the spiral waves and return to normal uh, heart rhythm. OK, here's another problem entirely, but it's a system which we drive away from equilibrium. You have a container of sand or some particles, 
that you oscillate vertically. You can take some particles and put them on top of a loudspeaker. If you turn up the, you set it for some frequency, say 25 cycles per second, oscillations per second. If the amplitude is small and you look down from above at the layer of sand, layer of particles, you see this flat layer just go up and down as you oscillate the speaker. Now, as you increase the amplitude, you get a point to an amplitude where the acceleration during a cycle exceeds at least for at least some period of time the acceleration of gravity. So the layer of sand leaves the container bottom, goes in the air, and then comes back and hits. And it still goes up and down if your maximum acceleration per cycle is twice that of gravity. The layer will go up, it comes down, you look at it, it's still a flat layer. But as you increase the amplitude of the acceleration, turn up the gain, you reach uh, an acceleration of about two and a half times gravity. And when you look at the pattern, and this has been done now by thousands of high school students, very simple experiment, very cheap, you see a pattern will spontaneously emerge. Here's the pattern that uh, was observed in a square container. And you look at one of these white dots, there are thousands of sand grains. But if you look up close, you can see the individual grains. This is just a close up here. Uh, that's a snapshot at an instant of time. One oscillation of the container later, where you have this pile of grains here, you'll get a pile of grains here. Two oscillations of the container later, you again have a pattern that's just like this one. So this was uh, studied as a function of the amplitude and the frequency. And Dr. Mark Shattuck, sitting in the back of the room there, <laughs> who will talk uh, in his sessions about molecular dynamic simulations, did molecular dynamic simulations for this problem where you have particles that are being oscillated up and down. And, and let's assume no air friction. Actually, you can evacuate the system so you don't have the additional complication of air friction on the particles. And so the particles just move in parabolic paths between collisions. And they collide and bounce off. They satisfy Newton's laws in the collision. And uh, you can calculate their trajectories in a simulation of the type you will do or you can do if you go to uh, Dr. Shattuck's session. And you can calculate the patterns. And this is the result of the simulation here for a small container. This was done uh, a number of years ago, so the computer capacity was small, so we couldn't handle a huge number of particles smaller number, 60,000 spheres. And the experiment was done in a small container, too. But you see, the agreement is pretty good. This is a photograph looking down at the experiment. And this is an uh, image made from the molecular dynamic simulation. And that's for a certain frequency of oscillation of the container, 15 oscillations per second. Now, if you change the frequency of oscillation, you can get a different pattern. This is a higher frequency of oscillation, and the pattern is basically one of stripes. You see in the small container the effect of walls, but if you had a big container, it would be parallel stripe pattern. And uh, it was found for some condition, some amplitude of oscillation, some frequency of oscillation, instead of having a pattern that filled the container, you'd have a localized pattern. And in this uh, structure, captured in a snapshot, is shown here at an instant of time. But this is a time evolving pattern. Dr. Shattuck has made a movie, very nice movie, and you can see what happens now. This is a peak, and then a little crater, peak, crater, peak, crater, as the container oscillates up and down. So two oscillations of the container, you would have the same pattern. One oscillation later, you'd have a crater if you started with a peak. Okay. <laughs>
Now let's go back to a simpler system, not spatially varying in time or varying in space, but one that can vary only in time. That is, we have chemicals that are fed into a reactor which is well stirred, so it's homogeneous, no spatial variation. And you can vary the concentration of the chemicals and look at the concentration of the reaction products. Now, the reaction products are a real mess here. There are roughly 80 different chemical species in this reactor. You're continuously feeding in chemicals. They're stirred, they react, produce many products, and they are being emptied at a uniform rate. So you can look then at the concentration of any one of the species, and one of them that is easy to measure in this particular reaction is the concentration of the bromide ion as a function of time. So here's bromide ion concentration versus time. You see the reaction is fairly slow. The period of oscillation is fairly slow, but it's oscillating. And for some conditions, you have nice periodic oscillations, just nearly a sine wave, but certainly periodic in time. As you vary the concentration of the feed, though, at some point, you get more complex behavior. And this is one situation where the amplitude is varying, you see, and it looks like it's, it maybe has a period that's this size here, because this one, uh, it looks like it's about the same here, but the amplitudes are varying. It's not exactly periodic. In fact, it's not periodic at all. And if you look in a Fourier transform of this time series, you don't see sharp peaks corresponding to periodic oscillations. You see broadband spectrum, so that you don't have a well-defined periodicity. You have something more complex. And one way you could study that is the kind of analysis you might do in some of these sessions. You can take this bromide ion concentration at some time t and at some later time, and that gives you a point in a two-dimensional space. So you have here this point, which is, this is the bromide ion concentration at time t, and this is, so you have your, your variables x, y, or just these, time t and time t plus tau. That gives you a point in a 2D space, and you can follow that point in time. So you let time evolve and see what, the, what you have at the next point in time. And you get a smooth curve that will describe the dynamics. It's called a phase space attractor. It describes the dynamics of the system. Now we can get something yet simpler. We can draw a line here and call this the x-axis. And the first time we cross this axis, we give the value that the, uh, we have on the, this x-axis, x1. So we cross it here, that's x1. The next time we come around and cross this axis, we call it x2. So that gives you a pair of points, x1, x2, and this map right here. And this, so you have xn plus 1 versus, and you have a particular point, x1, x2. Right? Now, now let's look and see what, how this uh, evolves in time. There's the point. Now, this is taking the concentration of bromide ion as a function of time and converting it into this graph of, in two dimensions of this bromide at time t and bromide with some later time tau. That gives us a continuous curve. And then each time we cross this line, we get a point. And we see the points are not randomly filling this graph. As time evolves, we have a graph emerging, which is a map of this axis into that axis. It's a one-dimensional map. And there's some scatter. It's real laboratory data. But you see it fills out a smooth curve. Given xn, 
This smooth curve gives xn plus 1. The system is deterministic, yet non-periodic. And that's what is the case in chaos. And in chaotic behavior, non-periodic behavior of a deterministic system, where if you have two points that are close together, initially, you can take any two points close together on different orbits here and look at them, they will spread apart exponentially fast. So after a while, you know, no, knowing the behavior of one curve, you know nothing about the other curve because it's spread so different. It's completely different. So the behavior, long-term behavior, is unpredictable. Short-term, you can predict. You have this deterministic function. But the, any fluctuations, any errors, any differences grow exponentially fast. OK. So let's look uh, at another type of process, growth processes. So here we have two glass plates, and there's a thin layer of oil between the two black glass plates, very thin. The distance between the plates is 0.1 millimeter, and the plates are in diameter 300 millimeters. So the size here is 3,000 times the thickness between the plates. And we fill the layer with oil, and then we pump air into the center hole. So this white is the oil layer, and the black is a little oil bubble in the center. And then we pump oil into the hole, pump air into the hole. And you see the air fingers. This is called viscous fingers. Oil is viscous. The fluids are viscous. The fingers grow into the oil layer, and the finger, each finger that starts to grow will then split, and the two new fingers split again, and this happens repeatedly. And this is a problem that uh, is a problem in Texas. Why in Texas? Because uh, for years, Texas has had an economy based on oil, and you, you remove the oil from the ground by pumping out the oil, something must replace the oil that's being pumped out. And that's water from the water table. And that water table, say, is initially flat. But as you pump out the oil, fingers of water penetrate the oil table. And after a while, you're pumping from your pump above ground. You're pumping water, even though there's a lot of oil left in the ground because of this instability. So the oil companies paid us to do these experiments because they would like to get more of that oil. Now, we didn't solve the problem, but we got money. So, <laughs> OK. OK. Now, you notice this is an irregular pattern. And I'm sure most of you, or many of you, are familiar with fractals, dimension which is not integer. This pattern is more complicated than say, solid surface, or square, or circle, one-dimensional, two-dimensional, or what is this? Well, nearly a century ago, in the 1920s, Louis Fry Richardson, an Englishman, wanted to compute the length of the coastline of Britain. So he took a map. And he took a ruler of a certain length scale and measured the coastline, say, with a length scale corresponding to 200 kilometers. And he got a certain length. And he said, well, let me take a finer scale, because I've got a better map than this. This doesn't approximate my map very well. So he took 50 kilometers, and the length was larger, and so on. He took smaller and smaller scales, and then plotted the result on the log-log scale. Uh, and concluded that the coastline of Britain was not one-dimensional, and it wasn't two-dimensional, but it was something that was not an integer dimension, 1.25. Now, not much work was done on non-integer dimensions until the 50s, when some mathematicians, for mathematical reasons, began to be interested uh, Renya and others in non-energy dimensions, but it doesn't enter the physical uh, science world until later Mandelbrot, uh, 
began to study non-integer dimensions, and he gave the term fractal to mean non-integer dimension. And uh, in fact, the dimension for the soil pattern is 1.71. Okay. Now we also in, did some experiments on an electrolyte zinc sulfate between two electrodes. And if you t close the switch here, tuck, close the switch, you grow a pattern that is fractal. And it has a dimension also 1.71. And, and so one can look at ways to characterize these spatial patterns that are fractal or, or dynamical systems which have phase space attractors which are non-integer. And uh, that was done in a series of papers. So more recently, we studied the growth of bacterial colonies. This is a colony of uh, bacteria, uh, Bacillus subtilis, they're rod-shaped bacteria, seven micrometers long, about a micron in diameter, and they have flagella, which rotate and propel them, so they're motile bacteria, and you can see them moving. This is looking with a microscope. You see the rods as they swim, and now you put a drop of the bacteria, maybe 10 bacteria in a five microliter drop, or maybe 10 million bacteria. It doesn't make a difference. You just start with a small droplet with some bacteria in it, and they multiply, grow and multiply, because there's nutrition in the gel. It's peptone. Some, when you make the gel, you mix in some protein that the bacteria like to eat, and the little drop of bacteria in the liquid will grow into a colony. And the, here's a picture of the colony. And this is a different bacterium. Panopacillus dendritiformis, doesn't matter. It's another rod-shaped bacterium. And you see this pattern, interestingly, has the same, approximately the same fractal dimension. Now, this is a hands-on school. So it's time for a hands-on experiment that everyone can do. Let's see here. I have some pieces of a garbage bag from my office. So this is University of Texas standard trash bag. <laughs> and uh, let's see, let's, everyone should take one of these and we'll do a hands-on experiment together. Okay. Don't do anything yet, but do notice, except to notice that one edge has of the square plastic sheet has a little cut in it. Now this plastic sheet is about 10 micrometers thick, 12 micrometers thick. Doesn't matter, you can do this with a plastic sheet of varying thicknesses. That's not critical at all. Wait till everyone gets a sheet. So take the side with a slit in it and put it up and then hold the sheet between your two hands firmly and then we're going to tear the sheet in half. You can do it slowly so that you tear, let the tear go right down the middle. Okay, does everybody have a sheet? You have one in the back? Okay. We'll be doing hands-on experiments for two weeks. This is numero uno, okay, <laughs> number one experiment. All right, so now just pull slowly and tear the sheet into two pieces. Now, I want you to look at the edge of the sheet. Look with your neighbor, talk to the person next to you. Look at the edge of the sh sheet and describe what you see. Just looking at the edge, looking at the edge, okay? What do you see? Describe it to your neighbor. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, anyone? What do you see? Yes, ma'am. Like a... Ah, you think it's a fractal. Do you see waves within waves within waves? Right? That's characteristic of a fractal. Well, let's look here. So this is a photograph made with an ordinary camera. Nothing special here, cheap camera. You make a section 30 millimeters long. That's what we see. Now, you see this little box up here on the left, the little rectangle? Let's just magnify that, all right? Magnify 3.2 times. And it kind of looks like the original pattern. And let's do it again, and again, and again. Now you begin to see a thickness here. I said the sheet was 10 microns thick. This is 250 microns, maybe it's a little more than that. And here we're, this is 80 micron, micrometers here. Now you see the thickness of the sheet, but you can see waves within waves. You see this fractal cascade, and you calculate the dimension. It happens to be 1.7. I don't know why. Um, very simple experiment, published in a magazine you've probably heard of. Okay. And there was some theory done by my colleagues, uh, Michael Martyr, who's a professor who works in condensed matter physics and not only dynamics, and he has a textbook, graduate textbook, condensed matter physics, is for those of you in physics. And he looked at different stretch rates. So if you measure the amount of stretch at the edge relative to the original separation between two points, so you take two points in the original sheet and see how far apart they are after the sheet has been torn. And in this uh, case here, the blue dots go to separation 1.8 times the original separation. And this, this is actually analysis, theory, not experiment, but we have similar curves from the experiment. Now, if the spreading rate near the edge is fast enough here, he found, so like this curve blue here, you get the fractal, waves within waves within waves. And if you go to the market and look at it's some leafy vegetables, like kale or some other leaf vegetables, you will see you can measure the fractal dimension of them. They, you see waves within waves within waves. So if the growth rate at the edge of the leaf is fast enough, you get the fractal. Other leaves don't grow quite as fast, and they may have two different frequencies. Now, if you take the waves on the edge, you analyze that, do a Fourier analysis, you find two waves are present for this um, growth rate right here. If it's this, this is the growth near the edge. And if it's slower, you may have them like some lettuce leaves have just one wave. But there are a good number of, of plants, and you can see this in flowers also, some cases where you have the fractal edge, where the growth near the edge is sufficiently fast. And in fact, uh, here's a violet flower, and this has waves, the fractal cascade. Lettuce leaf, plastic. This is looking at the edge, and this is looking from the side. Uh, now, what if you take a, trump, a, a cylinder and let the end grow? So uh, this was done by uh, Iran Sharon. It had a polyacrylamide gel, gel that was a cylindrical shape. You dip it in water and it expands. And depending upon the amount of expansion, you can get something that just expands and looks like a trumpet. Faster growth rate, you get one wave. Yet faster growth rate, you get a daffodil. Okay? You get something with fractal character. So we have these different fractals. Is there something universal about them? We go back to Newton, of course, and he was thinking in that uh, year 1666, 
The University of Cambridge was closed. There was a plague in London, and they closed the University of Cambridge. They closed all the universities because uh, many people were dying. 25% of the population of London died. And they sent the students and professors home. Newton was a young instructor in uh, 1666. And he went home, and it, he was sitting in his yard looking at an apple tree. Now, this is apparently a real, a true story. It's written by four different, he never wrote about it, but four people who were acquaintances of his or friends of his wrote this story that he told them, that thinking about the apple falling, he said, well, the, the apple must be attracted to the earth. Well, the earth is a sphere. Why does it go straight down? And he said, well, it's attracted to the right by that part of the earth and the right side and to the left, but must be attracted towards the center of the earth. And if the apple was attracted to the earth, the earth must be attracted to the apple. So there's a universal attraction between any two masses uh, near the Earth's surface. And then, decades, two decades later, he began to think, at least more than one decade, well, if this attraction between two masses on the Earth, is it universal? Does it occur over all length scales to the furthest orb of the universe, he said? Could it describe the planets? being attracted to the sun. And he, by that time, had his equations and worked out the trajectories of the planets, the universal law of gravitation. So this idea of universality, as developed in particular by Newton, is one that guides much of what we do in science now. We work in different areas of science where we find similar types of phenomena in many different disciplines, and that's situation here, what, what, whether this is some universality that is yet to be fully understood, but you are guided in our thinking by looking at different kinds of phenomena which might have a common description. Now what about the, I think I better stop. Where's my, yeah. Yeah. should I stop there? Uh. Yeah, I started late. Keep going. <laughs> I'll, I'll go, go quickly. So here are birds that are starlings. This is Rome. And every winter, millions of starlings flock along the Tiber River in Rome. And they form these wonderful patterns, which are really quite well-defined flocks. And this group of Italians looked at these bird flocks and made movies, and they're still analyzing these movies, but they, they made, using multiple cameras, they could track, now every starling looks pretty similar, so you have to have many cameras to keep track of a given one, but they kept track of, the, of as many as 10,000 starling in a flock, and they looked at the correlation as a function of flock size, flock size and they found this simple relationship. So applied the same type of analysis to the bacteria. Now the bacteria are moving in two dimensions, not three, much simpler. And they are moving at very low Reynolds number, so inertia plays no role. The, the birds have inertia, they can fly and they coast. But the, the bacteria move in two dimensions, and they, their interaction is quite different because of the difference in uh, size and speeds. And you can see them move. And you look through a microscope in a movie, and you can look at the velocity. And these arrows represent the velocity. And we say that the bacteria are in a cluster if their velocity vector, if they're close to a neighbor who has the same direction and magnitude of the velocity. So you see the cluster formation is very dynamic. Bacteria joining a cluster and leaving a cluster all the time. And you can see it's advantageous to be in a cluster. If you're not in a cluster, you don't move very fast. 
these not in a cluster move about one micrometer per second. A cluster moves typically 30 micrometers per second. So if you're going for nutrients or going to escape a, a toxic uh, chemical, then it's better to be in a cluster. And we did the same type of analysis as for starlings here. The green curve is for the starlings, and you see the bacteria give the same kind of curve. So I'm done. So let me just say, OK, we have different examples from inexpensive tabletop science of phenomena in nature that we can characterize using the kinds of tools we'll discuss during the next two weeks. Thank you. Thank you.